last part of Philippians chapter 1 on the subject of suffering, whether it be physical suffering, whether it be emotional suffering, whether it be financial suffering, whether it be spiritual, all of it, because it has a spiritual element to it, right? But he refers to it as a gift from the hand of God, okay? And he said, it is given unto you. I have here on the notes, it's a divinely bestowed honor as stated in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is the chapter where Paul refers to his thorn in the flesh. You remember that? And he said uh, he was taken up to the third heaven and God gave him a glimpse of heaven and then he brought him back to earth and lest he become proud, boastful, spend the rest of his life talking about his trip to heaven, uh, the Lord gave him a thorn in the flesh. We do not know what that thorn in the flesh was. Probably an affliction of the eyesight. Probably an affliction known as ophthalmia. You remember when he got saved in Acts 9, he lost his eyesight. You remember three days, three nights later on the miracle of Straight Street with Ananias, God gave him back his vision. And uh, he also said, you know, with, uh, when he wrote to the Galatians, you see with how large letters I have written unto you. He also said to the Galatians, you would have been willing to pluck out your own eyes and given them to me. So without a doubt, he had a, an affliction of the eyes that probably could have been his thorn in the flesh. We don't know. Some people think he was married and the thorn was his wife. But uh, don't worry, my wife will take care of me. Now, though we don't know what it was. That's probably what it was. But anyway... Paul had three prayer meetings for divine healing. Now, does God heal? Yes. Does God always heal? Does God heal when there's faith enough? I knew that one would get you. Sometimes. Sometimes God heals when there's no faith. Sometimes God heals because of the faith of others. Remember those guys that opened up the roof, lowered him, he said, when he saw their faith. And sometimes... God gets more glory out of the affliction than he does the cure. You say, well, I don't understand that. Neither do I, and that's why he's God and we're not. Right? I think Paul had fairly good faith, don't you? Three times. Lord, please take away the thorn. God said, no, I'm not going to take it away, Paul, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you sufficient grace to handle. This is all in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10. Then he said, my grace is sufficient. Now listen to what Paul said. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity. <laughs> okay? Just think of that statement. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity. Paul took his thorn, turned it into a throne, and was able to praise God and glorify God in the middle of it. Okay? Now, why? Here's what he said that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then also, if you study that in the context in 2 Corinthians 12, and in the context here, here's how you and I can look at the sufferings and trials and heartaches of life. And in a group of this size, we have problems and trials and heartaches represented here tonight. And probably you're sitting there and saying, praise God, I don't have any. Cheer up, you will. Right? They will come. And by the fact, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall, not might, shall suffer persecution. That doesn't mean you ought to go around getting as many people as you can to persecute you. Some Christians have a special gift of irking people. Not sure God gets a lot of glory out of that, right? But automatically, as you and I move in this whole world, we're moving the opposite direction which the world's going. When two opposing forces go by each other, they cause friction. So what's the key? It's here. It's in 2 Corinthians 12. A little statement in verse 29. For unto you it is given on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer. What's the next three words? For his sake. There's the key. There's the key. How can I face, no matter what comes my way, okay, and it's a lot easier to talk about it, preach about it, than it is to practice it. But how can I handle whatever comes my way 
when I realize this, it's for his sake. And if it's to God be the glory, and it's to bring glory, praise, and honor to him, then what will I do? I will look at my problems through the eyes of Jesus Christ rather than looking at Christ through my problems. Because, see, if I look at Christ through my circumstances, I'll get a blurred, distorted view of the Son of God. But if I look at my circumstances from heaven's perspective, you see, that's what wisdom is, by the way. James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, come to Cornerstone Baptist Church the week that Wendell called us there teaching Philip. No, no. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him what? Ask of God. He gives to all, what? Liberally, bountifully. And then it says, he'll not reprimand you or scold you for asking. So what is wisdom? Wisdom's divine discernment, spiritual perception. Here's the best definition of divine wisdom I've ever heard. Wis divine wisdom is the ability to view life's circumstances from heaven's perspective. Think that through. Divine wisdom is the ability to view life's circumstances from heaven's perspective. There's a song that says, looking through his eyes. So, if I see it from his perspective, if I see it through his eyes, <clears throat> and I realize it's for Christ's sake. John, in uh, Acts chapter 3, we have uh, the first recorded miracle of the New Testament church. The church was born in chapter 2. And uh, that miracle was the healing of a lame man at the gate, beautiful gate of the temple. Remember that? Man who had never walked in his life. He was there asking for some financial help. Peter and John went there the hour of prayer. And Peter said unto him, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I'll give you. What Peter really said to him was this. What you want I don't have, but I do have what you need. Okay? In the name of Jesus Christ, what did you say to do? Get up out of there. And I love, matter of fact, this would make even a Baptist shout. Okay? Said he went into the temple, jumping and leaping and praising God. Wow. You imagine those people that for years had passed by, saw him sitting there, never walked a day in his life, saw him sitting there asking for some help financially. You imagine when they saw him in the temple walking and leaping, praising God, okay? So then what happened? Well, the magistrates, the leaders, the Sanhedrin, they weren't happy. <laughs> so they called Peter and John in, and they said, what authority have you done this? What name have you done this in? They said the name of Jesus. Then they commanded them, don't you teach, don't you preach anymore in that name. And they said to them, whether we ought to obey men rather than God, you'll have to evaluate that. But as far as we're concerned, we ought to obey God rather than men. So what did they do? They went right out and started preaching. So what did they do? Threw them in jail. Okay. So then the next morning, they send them down to jail to get him, and he's not there. Okay. Even the keepers of the jail doesn't know where he is. Where are they? Okay. They're down there ministering again, okay? So they say, go down and get them, bring them in. So they go down and take them from the temple, bring them in. What are they? This is all in Acts 3, 4, and 5, okay? They severely beat them. That means they literally lashed that leather whip across their body, cutting the flesh. And then they commanded them, don't teach or preach in that name. And Acts 5 says this. They left the council rejoicing. Why? Because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. I have that reference there in your notes in Acts 5, okay? They were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So, what's the key? It's for his name. What's the key? It's for his sake. 
So I have a little section here. You see right there, it says illustration, Acts 5, 41, Peter and John rejoice. This is all on page 10, two-thirds of the way down. That's the reference right there that I just gave you, okay? I have a little fourfold thing here. It just happens to start with the same letter. By the way, our brother back here, he came tonight with a whole alliterated response to my teaching last night, and then I asked him to repeat it, and he couldn't remember. No, I'm just kidding. And, but anyway... I've, I've used this little thing for many years. Matter of fact, I would have used that back when we talked about the book of James two years ago. Purpose or purposes that God has in allowing, permitting, or even delivering himself trials, tribulations, heartaches, storms, difficulties into the life of the Christian. Now, Sometimes the Lord himself delivers the storm. Jonah chapter 1. Remember the story of Jonah? Go in the opposite direction. And it says the Lord sent out a great storm into the sea. God brought that one himself personally. In the case of Paul's thorn in the flesh, his affliction, what does the Bible say in that scripture in 2 Corinthians 12? Who delivered that one? Satan. It says a messenger of Satan sent to humble him. So God allowed the enemy to deliver that affliction in the life of the Apostle Paul. So we, when storms, what about Job? Okay, remember this conversation that God and the devil had? And God said, uh, you been considering my servant Job down there? Yeah, the devil says, you've got a hedge of protection around him. He's not the guy you think he is. You take that hedge away, let me at him, you're going to find out. Think of the permission that God gave Satan in the life of Job. Stop and think if he were to give him the same permission tonight in your life and mine. He said, okay, you go ahead. You go to work on it. Matter of fact, you do anything you want to. I'm putting one restriction on you. What was that one restriction? Don't you touch his life. Wow. So the devil goes to work on Job. Job is wealthy. He lost his wealth. He was healthy. He lost his health. Even his own wife said, why don't you curse God and die and get to do it? And then those three wonderful comforters. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. You know, it's like you're sick in the hospital and they come and said, let's just came to cheer you up. Said a friend of mine had the same thing you got and didn't live a month. You know, we call them Job's comforters, right? One of them said, you're a hypocrite. The other one said, you're full of sin. The other one said, you never did a mountain much anyway. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Chapter after chapter in the book of Job. Then Elihu, Elihu or Elihu, a young man. He's young, not supposed to know anything, okay? I was on ordination council years ago, and after we'd examined the candidate and we met as a committee, one of the men said, but he's so young. <laughs> One of the other men spoke up and said, you give him time, he'll overcome that. <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty good suggestion, okay? So Elihu says, he said more than all the others put together. He said, you know what, Job? I think probably God's trying to get your attention. I think God's trying to humble you. You see, folks, God often works behind the scenes but he moves every scene that he is behind. And when you can't trace his hand, you can always trust his heart. He said more than all the rest put together. And Job came out of it stronger than he went into it. And God began to restore. So what's the purpose? For his name, for his sake. So what does God want to accomplish in your life and mine how come he doesn't just let the journey be nothing but just whew, smooth sailing? You see, the day you get saved, he promised you a safe port. He didn't promise you a smooth passage. He didn't say there'd be no troubled waters. He didn't. Remember the disciples in the boat, in the storm, in the lake? What did Jesus say? Him? Here's what he said to the disciples. Find this in the Gospels. He said, let's get in the boat and pass over to the other side of the lake. That's pretty simple. Now, the disciples are like we are sometimes. They misunderstood it. They thought he said, let's get in the boat 
go out part way and sink. That's what they thought he said, okay? So they go out a ways, and the storm comes up, a terrific storm. Question, you think Jesus had any idea that storm was coming? How come he didn't delay the departure? Remember Hurricane Andrew that wiped out South Florida? My wife and I were on a cruise ship in the Caribbean at the time. Real smart move. And, and they did delay our departure. And then the Coast Guard or whoever's responsible cleared them to go. How come the Lord didn't just delay the departure? He could have. No. He wanted to teach his disciples a lesson in the storm. Now, this storm is so severe that the boat is filling with water. And Jesus is asleep down in the boat, bottom of the boat, so therefore he must have been floating around in the water. Right? The boat's full of water. He's down the bottom of the boat, and he's sound asleep. He can sleep in the midst of a storm. Remember the little chorus with Christ in the vessel? You can smile at the storm as you go sailing home, right? So what happened? Well, the, they came and they shake him. They wake him up and they said, don't you care that we're drowning? Don't you care we're sinking? <laughs> now question, could that boat sink with Jesus on board? And when he told them when they get in the boat, where did he say they were going? The other side. So where did he tell you you're going when he saved you? The other side. We looked at it last night, Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing. He which had begun will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Okay? Saved, sanctified, and satisfied. Now, Jesus gets up. He rebukes the disciples. He rebukes the wind and the sea. And then they go on to the other side. O oh, you of little faith. It says they were exceedingly afraid in that scripture the first time. They were exceedingly afraid of the storm. But the second time when it says they were fearful was a proper fear of God. Not a fear of God in the fact that I'm scared of him. A fear of God in the fact that I respect, reverence, and hold him in high regard. So, God will bring trials. And does it ever happen that some Christians seem to go through life mostly without many trials, hardships, severe ones at least. And then does it even look sometimes that some people just seem to get more than their share of trials and heartaches and difficulties, looking at it from man's perspective? Yeah, that does happen. So why does God do it? What are his purposes? Four things. Number one, he does it to prove us. Proves what? Here's what it says in 1 Peter 1, 7, the verse there. The trying of your faith being much more precious than if gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In James chapter 1, James says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations, knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience. So what's he doing? He's proving the reality of my faith. That's it. That's it. If I'm never tested, how am I going to know how strong my faith is? If I'm never tried, I never face difficult circumstances of life, I'm not able to prove the sufficiency of our God. So it proves, you know the old saying, when the going gets tough, the what? The tough get going. That's true in the Christian life. Secondly, not only to prove us, it perfects us. And the basic meaning of the word perfect there is this, it matures us. You say, how under God's heaven do storms and trials and heartaches and sorrows mature you? Well, let me ask you a simple question. When do we pray more? When we're helped? and well and everything is going great or when we seem to have more aches than Carter's got liver pills. When do we really spend more time in the presence of Almighty God? 
when the going is tough, when the bills are there and the balance doesn't come close. Okay? So what happens? Trials and difficulties will drive us to our knees. They'll drive us to the throne of grace. They'll drive us to the presence of Almighty God. And so the reference I give there is James 1, 2 to 4. It says, the trying of your faith, listen to what it says, it worketh patience. The word's the word endurance. Then he says, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect. That's James 1, 4. What's the word perfect there? That you might be developed, that you might be full grown, that you might be mature. It doesn't mean sinless, okay? That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And by the way, it's the very next verse. It says, if you lack wisdom, if you lack the ability to be able to handle this, get on your knees and cry out to God because he's got an ample supply and he'll give you the wisdom you need for the situation. Thirdly, not only is it to prove me and to perfect and mature me, it's to purify me. That's that verse in 1 Peter 1, 7. It says, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Question, why do they put gold in the fire? To purify it, take out the dross, take out the junk. Why does God allow you and me to go through the fires of suffering and testing to get the junk out of our lives? That's it. Get out the dross. Get out the garbage. Now, I like what Dr. Warren, Warren Wiersbe says in one of his books. Might be Be Joyful. I'm not sure which one. He says, God allows you and me to go through the severe fires of testing. But remember, his hand is always on the thermostat. I love that. You know what he's saying? He controls the temperature. And it may take a lot less heat to get your attention than it does mine. Right? Or vice versa. That's it. But our God makes no mistake. Remember many, many years ago, I had a vehicle need a new piece of tailpipe, and they no longer made that piece of tailpipe. So a uh, friend of mine who said he could take care of that and make it for me, no problem, blacksmith. So he got the piece of pipe. I remember a straight piece of pipe. I was there the day that he started to shape it, and he would heat that thing and heat it. When he got it just the temperature he wanted, he began to shape it. And sometimes it had a little too hot. He'd dip it in the water, and he just folded that piece of pipe and made it exactly what was needed, okay? You know what? That reminds me of the book of Jeremiah went down to the potter's house. Remember the vessel that was in the hand of the potter? My wife and I, on our first trip to India many years ago, we went with a missionary to the potter's house, the old-fashioned one, where they pump the thing with their feet, okay? And we saw it. And then you remember in Jeremiah, the vessel was marred in the hand of the potter. So what did he do? <laughs> Threw it away. No, he didn't. It says he made it again another vessel. Aren't you glad? God doesn't just take you and me and throw us on the junk heap when we become marred by our own wrongdoing, by our own unbelief, by our own stubbornness, right? And then when God gets you and me just at the right temperature, he's able, just like that blacksmith, to begin to shape me and to mold me into his image. Because remember, what is it that God's trying to do in your life and mine every day? Here it is. Here's the ultimate. He's trying to make me just like Jesus. <laughs> got a job on his hands, hasn't he? Well, don't smile. He's got a job. No. Okay. That's what he's doing. He's conforming me to the image of his dear son. So many Christians can quote Romans 8, 28. Some quote it out of context. But so few know verse 29. Romans 8, 28 said, We know all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Listen to the next verse. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his dear son. We're going to see more of that when we get to chapter 3. Paul said, I want to be made conformable unto his death. So what's he doing? He's purifying us. He's cleaning us up. What's the greatest cleanser in the world? The greatest cleanser in the world, folks, not put out by Procter & Gamble. The greatest cleanser is the blood in the book. And I'm made safe by the blood 
and I'm made sure by the book. I've been made clean by the blood. I'm kept clean by the book. Now you are clean through the word, John 15, 3. Then fourthly, and I love this one. You know why God allows you and me to go through storms, trials, sufferings, heartaches, sorrows, difficulties? You know what one of the main reasons is? Don't miss this one. So you and I can be of ministry to others when they're going through difficult, trying, and hard times. And that scripture I gave there in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, here's what it says. God comforts us in our affliction so that we can comfort others in their affliction. So one of the purposes for suffering when he says it's given unto you, a gift from the hand of God, is not just to give it selfishly. It's not just to give it because God enjoys making people miserable. It's not just to give it so he can say, well, I'm going to test that guy and I'm going to lay him flat down on the ground. No. He said, listen, if you allow me to clean you up, get the junk out of your life, you allow me to mature you and develop you, you allow me to prove the reality of your faith, guess what? I'm going to be able to use you and give you a ministry in the lives of hurting people. And I don't know whether you've noticed it or not, but there are a lot of hurting people. Spurgeon said in his lectures to his preacher boys, if you always preach to troubled hearts, you will never lack for an audience. If you always preach to troubled hearts, you will never lack for an audience. So here it is. That's the scripture in 2 Corinthians 1. I can comfort you in your affliction, then you in turn what? are able to come for somebody else because you can say, you know what? Been there, done that. Let me tell you how God used it in my life. Let me tell you how God allowed me to come out the victor and not the victim, to come out the overcomer rather than being overcome. So then you can have a great ministry in the life of someone else. So there's purpose in suffering. So trials are precious Productive and purposeful. First Peter 1 says they're precious. James 1 says, James 1, 12. Here's what it says. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation and trials, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. That's that reference in James 1, 12 there on page 11. And then purposeful. What is it? What I do now, Jesus said in John 13, 7, You don't know, but he said, I want to tell you something. You will know later on. You will know hereafter. You know, have you ever noticed sometimes when you're in the middle of a situation, you just can't figure it out? What's taking place? What's God trying to do? Then when it's all over and God has done his ministry in your life and you look back on it and you see it from a whole different perspective. And then we're caused to say, Why couldn't I see that? Well, when we're in the middle of the storm, we don't always see it as it is, right? Dr. David Jeremiah says everybody is in one of three stages of life. We've either just come through a major storm, we're in the middle of a major storm, or there's a major storm on the horizon. (laughs) And that's, that's encouraging, isn't it? Okay, but what? get the little statement here. For his sake. So Paul, was he suffering? Of course he was. Now, did he have some liberty? Yes. But was he facing death? Yes. Did he know his life was on the line? Yes. How would you like to go to sleep every night realizing that there's a whole society, a whole organized government has got one purpose, and that is to get you. That is to kill you. That was what he had on his mind. So then I wrap up the chapter, okay? What does suffering do in my life? I put down four things there. First thing, it touches me. What do I mean by that? Suffering, trials, and heartache will get your attention better probably than any other single thing. And do we always understand it all? Of course we don't. And even years later, will we fully understand? No, no, not at all. 
But God in his mercy and God in his grace ministers to us. And as he gave Paul sufficient grace. Secondly, it not only touches me, it teaches me. We learn better in the school of affliction, difficulty, and hard knocks than we do any other way. But I don't know if you noticed or not, but some of us, probably nobody that's here tonight, but you'd be able to help those other people who weren't able to come. Some of us are slow learners. I see heads are nodding all over. Okay. In other words, God speaks and we don't really get it. And then he speaks a little more forcefully. We still don't get it. And sometimes God has to come along and hit us over the head with a two by four. And you know what? Some Christians don't even respond to a two by four. And I believe God's saying, what am I going to have to do to get your attention? So it teaches me always, by the way, always be teachable. I've had the privilege and joy of meeting, knowing, sharing, and working with, like I worked for a few days with Dr. Warren Wiersbe. I worked for eight whole days with Dr. Vance Hagner. These guys were my idols. These are the guys whose books I like to saturate my life with. Okay, You know what kind of men they were? <laughs> Just Dr. Lee Robertson, Tennessee Temple, Highland Park. He was a dear friend. They gave me my honorary doctorate. You know what kind of men they were? Just the most gracious, down to her, humble. And then I get with some guy out in East Podunk, thinks he's God's gift to the world, you know? No, 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 no. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about him. Doc Robertson, busy as he was, at that time had a church of about 6,000 people. I preached the January revival in the church for eight days, 6,000 seat auditorium. We put chairs in every night. And now the day the school's gone. It's no longer there. He said to me one day, he said, Boda Monday, he said, make sure you and your wife leave Thursday free. I said, okay. He said, I want to give you a little sightseeing tour of the city of Chattanooga. So Doc Robertson takes about four hours, drives my wife and I all over Chattanooga, showed us every building he bought in the last 40 years. <laughs> no, we just had a we just had a great day. So here's a man. A school of that time, 3,500 students, church of five, 6,000, and he's given you several hours just to show you his city. You know what that is? That's somebody who's learned the secret, not I, but Christ. You see, Paul's motto before he got saved was not Christ, but I. But after meeting the Lord on the road to Damascus, that motto changed, not I, but Christ. So let's be teachable, always be teachable. Then thirdly, it toughens me. I don't mean macho man toughness. I mean it strengthens you because every time we face a storm and we come out the overcomer instead of being overcome, we're that much stronger when the next storm comes. But then here's the final one. You know what else it does? It tenderizes us. It softens us. Now I know that many of you here tonight have butchered meat at one time or another, okay? I know. And if you haven't, you've been around an animal when it was butchered. What's one of the ways that they tenderize a piece of meat? A pound on it, okay? Had a steak in a restaurant about three weeks ago. They should have pounded about another two hours, <laughs> okay? I mean, I chewed on that until I got tired, and then I gave up but I'm not supposed to be eating red meat anyway. So the Lord knew and toughened it up for me. No. Now, okay, so how do you tenderize a piece of meat? You beat on it. You pound on it. Do you think sometimes God beats and pounds on his people to tenderize them a little? Sure he does. Oh, yeah, he does. No and is a but. And remember this. He doeth all things well. He makes no mistakes. So what's the whole purpose? For his Name's sake. There it is, for his name's sake. Well, that's Philippians chapter 1. Let me introduce chapter 2, and then tomorrow night 
we'll hit that one, okay? Chapter 1 is the believer's priority. To me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Chapter 2, look at your basic outline. Go way back to page number, I don't know what it is, 2 or 3, and you will see the basic outline. Let me go back there and find it. It's page number 4. Go back to page number 4 and look at point number 2, chapter 2. I call it the believer's pattern, okay? Key verse, 2-5. Here it is. Let this mind, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay? Here's the outline. First, the exhortation. Here's the exhortation. Paul says to Philippians, you want to make me a joyful Christian? Start getting along with one another. It's exactly what he said. You want to make me a joyful? He said right there in those opening verses. You want to fulfill my joy? He said, be ye like-minded. That's it. So, that's the exhortation. Now, the example. Of course, if you're going to give the ideal example of the mind of Christ, who would you use? Oh, really? Yeah, you'd use Christ. So that's what he does. And here's what he says about the Lord Jesus. It says he made himself of no reputation. It says he took upon him the form of a servant. It said he was made in the likeness of men. He said he humbled himself. Jesus we're talking about now. And he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wow. And there are four distinct characteristics in those verses on the mind or the attitude of Christ. That ought to be the attitude that every one of us has. We'll talk about it tomorrow night. Then thirdly, the exaltation. And the exaltation, verses 9, 10, and 11, you know it. God has highly exalted him, given him a name as above every name, at the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow, every tongue confess. Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. He humbled, God exalted. What did Jesus say? He that humbleth himself shall be exalted, but he that exalts himself shall be what? Yeah. By the way, be very careful when you pray, Lord, humble me. Because when God does it, it's a lot more painful than if we would just do it ourselves. The Bible says, humble yourself, therefore, in the sight of God. Okay? Don't leave it up to him to have to do it. Next is the explanation. What's the explanation? Here it is. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You say, yep, that's what I say. You work out yours, I'll work out mine. No, look at the very next verse where he says, for it is God which worketh in you. So it's not the ups and downs of Christianity, it's the in and outs. You and I can only work out to the world what we've allowed God the Holy Spirit to work in. And there's the explanation. Then he gets down to verse 16, he says, holding forth the word of life. Then, the final point, I call it the expression, and here's what you have in verses 19 to 30. He gives us two guys, and he says, you want to know about the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ? Let me tell you a couple of guys that are putting that into practice in their life. Who are they? The guy that was with him in the greeting in verse 1, who was he? Timothy, okay? Timothy's mentioned over 20 times in Paul's writing. He was dear to the apostle. The second one is the guy that the church at Philippi sent to Rome with the gift and to find out how Paul's doing. So these two guys, he says, have the mind of Christ. Now, every Christian that's been saved any length of time can quote Philippians 1.21, me to live is Christ to die is gain. I'd like to see more Christians learn Philippians 2.21. You know what it says? For all Seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. What a sad commentary on the church of his day. But what a sad commentary that would be on the church of our day. Okay? All seek their own. Matter of fact, he said, I'm going to send Timothy to you. And then he said this, I don't have anybody else like Timothy. He said, this guy's got the right attitude. This guy's got the right spirit. And I'm going to send him. Matter of fact, he said, 
I want to send Epaphroditus back to you. He said, he's my fellow laborer. He said, he's your minister, your servant, minister to me on your behalf. But then there's a third person in these verses who has the mind of Christ. And he doesn't name himself. It just happens to be the Apostle Paul. You take within the context of all the verses and you begin to see the motive and purpose of his life was what? The attitude of Christ. Have you ever at any time in your life said to one of your children, you need an attitude adjustment? Oh, you have. I read that somewhere in a book. I'd never heard it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, when it comes to spiritual things, we could use a what? An attitude adjustment. God bless you. It's 830. Let's pray. Father, what a joy to open the word of God. Your word's a lamp under our feet. It's a light under our path. Help us, Lord, to hide it in our hearts. We might not sin against you. Lord, how we thank you for each one who's come on a Tuesday night to be here and to study, and to share together your word. Bless each one. Bless every home that's represented here tonight. And Lord, whatever the trials or problems or heartaches or sorrows of life that each or any one may be facing tonight, help us to see it for your sake. Help us to see it for your name's sake. And Lord, let us see it in the light of eternity that it will make us better rather than bitter. We love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, God bless you. Have a good one.